When the term supervillain is used, the first image that probably pops into a lot of people's heads is that of Lex Luthor. Though not the first theme villain to take on the Man of Steel that was actually a character called the Archer, Luthor has been a constant thorn in Superman's side since 1940. Throughout the Golden and Silver Ages of comics, Luthor was a scientist bent on world domination whose hatred of Superman dated back to youth. In Adventure Comics number 271, it was revealed that Lex Luthor had actually been friends with Superboy, saving him from an exposure to a large piece of kryptonite. Superboy would then construct a laboratory in order for Lex to formulate a kryptonite antidote. When a fire broke out in the lab, Superboy attempted to put it out by using his super breath. This resulted in various chemicals being blown back into Luthor's face, resulting in his baldness. Decrying Superboy for being jealous of his genius, Lex vowed to destroy the Kryptonian instead of helping him. With the DC Universe being rebooted in the wake of the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline, Lex Luthor would wind up being repackaged from a scientist into a ruthless business tycoon, though one still in possession of a high scientific intellect. Also, any ties to Superman's past in Smallville were completely eliminated. Lex Luthor is now an abused child who grew up in Metropolis's suicide slum ghetto. His hatred for the Man of Steel came out of a combination of jealousy for the public's constant adoration of him and the fact that Superman kept revealing Luthor's underhanded business dealings. At the dawn of the new millennium, Lex's backstory got revised again, no doubt inspired by the mega success of the television show Smallville. The idea of Lex Luthor having a past relationship with Clark Kent eventually worked its way back into the comics, mainly via a series called Superman Birthright. In 2005, writer Brian Azzarello and artist Lee Bermejo teamed up to tell a story of Superman's early days from Lex Luthor's point of view. And that's what we're looking at today. This is Lex Luthor, Man of Steel. It's the end of the workday as Lex makes small talk with his custodian named Stan. Stan's kid is a science whiz who's been acting up and cutting class. So in an attempt to keep the kid on straight and narrow, Lex offers up an exclusive invite to the Lex Corp Science Spire's grand opening. After Stan finishes up and leaves, Lex has his personal secretary, Mona, arrange for Joey, that's Stan's kid, to attend a prestigious private school at the expense of another kid's scholarship. Mona also has some file footage of Superman breaking up bank robbery. The two look on as Luthor contemplates the Man of Steel. Is he really as altruistic as he says he is? Why doesn't he just take over? After all, that's what Lex Luthor would do. All of this is interrupted by a phone call from Beirut. Sasha Fedorov, a Chechenian scientist under Lex's employee, has been taken hostage. Lex orders his agent, known as Mr. Orr, to do everything necessary to get Dr. Fedorov and his family passage to the United States. So Orr hires a few soldiers of fortune to take care of the terrorists, and then after that, Mr. Orr takes care of the soldiers of fortune. Luthor turns his attention back to Superman. The Man of Steel was supposed to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. America, where all men are created equal. Except Superman isn't a man. He's a god. As Lex turns off the video, he finds Superman floating at his window, but he's not surprised. When Lex sees Superman, he sees the end of mankind's potential. In Lex, mankind has hope. A few weeks later, Lex is having a board meeting concerning the fishing touches on the science spire. The project has gone over budget, and the construction union is looking for more money to finish. Technically, the union contract allows for them to do so, and also perform general maintenance once the science spire is completed. Unless, of course, the science spire would become a not-for-profit business, and that would cut the union out. Luther gives the go-ahead on the leverage plan, despite Mona's concerns that the head of the union, named Tony Amante, won't give up that easily. Well, I mean, why wouldn't he? His best chance at the Stanley Cup was the 94 Rangers, and they traded him in the middle of the season to the Blackhawks. He'd never get that close again. I'm guessing he's a little salty about it. Lex goes down to the lab to visit with Dr. Fedorov about a special project. Fedorov says the project is coming along well as Lex gazes upon a woman in a suspended animation tank. And much like Star Labs from the story we covered last time, Lex Luthor seems to also have access to tanks that come with strategically placed sensor bubbles. Lex talks to the woman in the tank named Hope. The two flirt with each other as Lex informs her that Dr. Fedorov is making her better. However, there's still something missing, so Lex is going to have to take a trip to acquire it. As this is happening, Mr. Orr pays a visit to Tony Monte to convince him to take Lex's plan. A few whacks with a sledgehammer and a dangling over the ledge of the science spire provides enough leverage. Lex gets the good news as his plane touches down in Gotham City for his meeting with Bruce Wayne. The two one percenters sit down over stakes as Lex has gone low carb to hash out business. Wayne Medical Research has made a technological breakthrough in Alzheimer's studies, and Lex believes it could have other applications. To grease the wheels, Lex presents Bruce with a large chunk of unrefined kryptonite. Bruce is still unsure. After all, isn't Superman supposed to be on our side? But Lex manages to plant enough doubt before leaving. While out on patrol, Superman arrives in Gotham City to confront Batman. The two get in a tussle, and the kryptonite is lost over a ledge. The next morning, a battered and bruised Bruce Wayne calls Lex. The deal's on.
Weeks later, and Lex is hosting a press conference at the newly completed Science Spire. The building was constructed to help mankind achieve its truest potential, to reach higher and higher, and to provide hope. And with that, Metropolis's newest hero makes her debut. Over the next month, Hope becomes the darling of Metropolis. Sure, there are a few naysayers, mainly Clark Kent of the Daily Planet, but by and large, the general populace has taken to Hope. She's strictly a metropolitan superhero, since Superman occasionally leaves for certain matters. Or in other words, Hope can be there when Superman can't. Hope has also grown closer to Lex as the two seem smitten with each other, much to Mona's chagrin. She calls Lex out while Hope is taking care of a fire, but Lex just points out his secretary's own private jealousy. More time passes and Hope's popularity increases as she makes several appearances on daytime television. However, things are not all rosy as Mr. Orr is meeting up with someone in a park. A very generous offer is being made to Winslow Schott, a.k.a. the Toy Man. Toy Man is the split personality of Winslow Schott, a British toy maker who lost his job and began using his toys as deadly weapons, including explosives. Unfortunately, he also turned to child abduction and murder, most notably kidnapping and killing Adam Morgan, the son of Daily Planet reporter Cat Grant. The next morning, while Lex is picking up a newspaper, a large explosion goes off. Mono arrives in Lex's limo to explain the situation. The explosion was at a jeweler's business that also shared space with a daycare center. Hope flies in to help, but in the end, 94 people, 68 of which are children, are dead. Amongst them were Dr. Fedorov and his family. Later, Lex goes over the closed-circuit camera footage with Hope, and they spot the toy man fleeing the scene. The gravity of the situation begins to get the Hope, which is further exacerbated by Mona's sniping. Lex begins comforting his created hero, and the two begin having sex. Yeah, Lex is being pretty scuzzy here. I mean, romancing your bioengineered superhero in creation, not to mention the fact that he's also in an implied sexual relationship with Mona. But, I mean, it could be worse. I mean, it's not like Lex Luthor once staged his own death, downloaded his consciousness into a clone body so he could then pass himself off as an illegitimate heir, whereupon he would then romance a teenage Supergirl. Oh, wait, that really did happen. A report comes out about Toy Man's location and Hope prepares to leave with Lex making arrangements to meet up at the Science Spire later. Mona enters as Lex is putting on his clothes, carrying a letter of resignation, which Luthor immediately rejects. Luthor then receives a call from Mr. Orr and the truth comes to light. In reality, Luthor had arranged for the bombing and directed Orr to the Toy Man. Now it's time for the final part of the plan to be put into motion and tie up all the loose ends starting with Mr. Orr. As Orr tries fleeing for his life, Superman goes after Toy Man with Hope beating him to the punch. Hope takes off carrying Toy Man when something goes wrong and she loses her grip. It seems that Luthor has somehow taken control of the heroine's body and caused her to drop the villain. Shot begins plummeting to the death to the crowd's delight, only for the Big Blue Boy Scout to intercept the descent, upsetting many in the process. Superman goes after Hope as she makes a desperate run to the science spire where she believes Lex is waiting. Her powers begin malfunctioning and Superman blasts her with his heat vision, exposing several biocircuits in the process. She decks the Man of Steel and starts trying to get into the spire. It's then that Luther initiates a self-destruct sequence and Hope explodes in the building, taking the science spire with her. Superman immediately heads for Luthor, who's on the defensive. Anyone in Metropolis would have gladly seen Toy Man die for what he did, but Superman has a sense of honor. Also, he just took out a popular hero and an economic boon to the city. Superman always claims to see the best in humanity, but it never seems to apply to humanity's desires. Luthor may not be able to physically beat Superman, but if he can change just one mind with his actions, one mind, it's a type of victory. As Superman flies away, though, Luthor sits in solitude and admits the truth. This was no victory. He's lost too much, and he still has hope. And that concludes Lex Luthor, Man of Steel. Now, I should point out that if you are interested in this, it has actually been re-released under a different title. It's now known as Luthor, and it's part of DC's new Mature Reader's Black Label line, which is strange because this really isn't a Mature Reader's book. I mean, pretty much all the violence happens off-panel. There's no foul language, and I've seen more graphic sex on primetime network television. So... Yeah, it doesn't really add up to a mature reader's book, in my opinion. That being said, this is a really good story. I think there's some great characterization for Luthor. He comes across as well-rounded. You understand his motivations, but you also see that he's really a not good person. He's a horrible human being who only puts his own self-interest before anyone else's. And I think there's some spectacular artwork from Lieber Mayo in this and some great pacing throughout. There's not really a lot of dead spots in this story at all. It's just tightly told. It fills its five issues perfectly. If I do have one nitpick, and it is kind of nitpicky, it's that the continuity's 
kind of wonky at some points. I, like I said earlier, I believe this is supposed to be a telling of the early days between Luthor and Superman, i.e. Superman's just right in Metropolis. However, at one point in the story, Mona mentions that she had a childhood crush on Superman, which would sort of imply that he's been around longer than that, but the Superman-Batman confrontation rings more of their early days when they had just met and didn't completely trust each other, not in the established DC continuity where they don't, like, Batman's not fully trusting a Superman, but they are more friendly than they are, well, in this storyline at all. Then again, Luthor is an unreliable narrator, so maybe that's not entirely the case. Also, Dr. Fedorov's name changes a few times. At one point, it's Sasha, and then it's Sergei, and then it goes back to Sasha again. So, uh, <laughs> again, minor nitpicks, though, throughout all of this. I am going to give Lex Luthor Man of Steel... In A. And with that, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review. Got a request for the show? Check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cat productions. And if you like the video, give it a like, share it, subscribe, and ring that notification bell.